Welcome to chapter 7, where we'll be talking about cell membranes and cell transport. Uh, so starting off, we're going to talk about just the structure of cell membranes or plasma membranes. Uh, you'll see that they'll typically talk about them being plasma membranes because we want to make sure you guys understand that any type of membrane that's biological will typically have about the same structure. Now we will talk about the fact that they're not identical. You can't just interchange any membrane for any other membrane, but they are going to be very similar even if not exactly the same. Uh, so starting off, they're all going to kind of follow some basic patterns. The first is they're going to be something that we'll call selectively permeable. Uh, now this is just a really fancy term for essentially saying some stuff can come in, some stuff can't. So it's kind of like the bouncer at a club where it kind of looks at it and decides, all right, should you be able to come in or not? Uh, in this case, it's going to be based upon chemical properties. It can't look at you and say, oh yeah, you're pretty, you can come in, or you're rich. Uh, ultimately, it's going to look at it and it's going to base this largely upon size. And another major thing that you'll see will be charge, which includes polarity. And so in general, membranes will be better at letting in things that are small, and they'll be better at letting in things that are more nonpolar. So sometimes if you're small enough and polar enough, you can still get through. Uh, but ions, pretty much of any size, usually can't get through because they're just too charged. And the reason for this comes down to the amphipathic nature of the cell membrane. And what this really comes down to is that when you look at a cell membrane, you'll see it's a phospholipid bilayer. So that means we've got these phospholipids, which have this polar head region that contains a phosphate. Uh, it's, we'll leave it at that. I'll keep things simple. And then it's got two fatty acid tails that are coming down. So this is really just a modified triglyceride uh, or triglycerol, depending on what you want to call it, where instead of having that third tail, it replaced that third fatty acid tail with a phosphate group. So that was what I was going to bring up before. That's just the idea of how we get this. So once we've got this, this head region, uh, this glycerol, modified glycerol region, is going to ultimately be polar. And so that means that it's going to be hydrophilic. It's not going to mind water. Because it's polar, it'll get along with water just fine. But these fatty acid tails are hydrocarbons. And if you remember, carbon and hydrogen are nonpolar bonds, and they do not like water. So this middle region, where we've got two sets of fatty acid tails, one from the top row, one from the bottom row of phospholipids, this one is going to be nonpolar. Uh, so this one ultimately is going to be hydrophobic. It's going to not want to be near water. So that's why this phospholipid bilayer is so stable, because we can have water on the outside of the cell, and we can have water on the inside of the cell. And on either side, what the water is seeing is these hydrophilic or these polar heads, which are fine with this. But on the, in the middle part, they're then kind of isolated. They're protected from the water by those heads. Those provide like a buffer. And so this middle zone being nonpolar is not going to want anything that's charged, anything that's polar to go through it. Uh, it's that same idea, water and oil don't mix, and so this middle part is essentially the oil part, if you will, uh, the fatty acid part. And so this is why things that are small but still charged or whatever else will have a very difficult time passing through. It's due to this amphipathic nature. They can be attracted up towards the surface of the cell membrane, uh, but they ultimately can't get through it. And then the fluid mosaic model, I, I've got this picture up here to try to illustrate this. Uh, if you look at a cell membrane, it's going to have a whole bunch of these phospholipids that are all kind of floating around, but they're not covalently bonded. They're being held together largely by these hydrophobic interactions because the tails want to stay away from water. So these are not particularly strong, which means that the individual phospholipids can move around. Just like when you see a crowd, uh, so if there's like a rally or something, the individual people will flow. They'll kind of move around. So overall, you have a crowd, you have people packed closely together, but you're not going to see where people within that crowd are fixed in position. That's the fluid part of the fluid mosaic. The mosaic part is going to be that there's other stuff that's in the phospholipid bilayer that's not phospholipids. And so this one, there's a fountain. Uh, you could put a stage. There's lots of stuff that you can kind of put in the midst of the crowd that would appear to be kind of floating in the crowd where there's people surrounding it, but it's still kind of mixed in. That's kind of what you're going to see, where there'll be these other substances that would, will be part of this membrane, but they're the mosaic part. The mosaic is all the stuff that's not a phospholipid, that's still embedded in, that's still part of this complex membrane. So 
We've got our phospholipids. We kind of already brought those up, so I'm not going to go too crazy. You're also going to see steroids, cholesterol specifically. That's going to be these four carbon rings you can see here in the picture. So they kind of wedge themselves in between phospholipids, uh, specifically in between the phospholipid tails. So cholesterol is going to do really good at stabiliz stabilization. Um, there we go. See if I can spell. Uh, and the purpose here is they act a lot like unsaturated fatty acids work, where they can kind of wedge in between those fatty acids and they can kind of push things apart. So that means at cold temperatures, they help space things out. Now, in some cases, too, at warmer temperatures, because they're also nonpolar, they can kind of add to this hydrophobic interaction. So they can also have at warmer temperatures a similar effect, uh, except like something like the opposite, where it kind of adds in some more glue, if you will, to try to hold this membrane together. So it also stabilizes membranes when they get very hot. It's not just about the cold because they can increase these hydrophobic interactions by intermingling with those fatty acid tails and giving them something else to grab onto. So cholesterol will be a stabilizing agent pretty much regardless of what's going on. It's a very useful stabilizing agent. So don't victimize cholesterol for everything. Uh, it's actually very useful for our cell membranes. Beyond that, we've got the rest of the mosaic part. Right? And that's typically going to be proteins is the number one thing. And with proteins, we'll typically see two types. You have integral proteins, uh, many of which are called transmembrane because they ultimately kind of pass through the whole membrane. So if you look at this protein, it's kind of like a nail that's been sunk into a board. And so this protein will actually pass through all of the membrane uh, from the heads on one side to the heads on the other. And this is important because there's lots of stuff that can use these guys essentially for like transport, which we'll talk about coming up. You know, they can allow for certain functions that otherwise wouldn't work because the phospholipid bilayer doesn't like it. Uh, it, it doesn't want to allow something to pass. But by having these transmembrane proteins, it's like having a bridge or a tunnel. It gives you another avenue to get something across without having to essentially swim the river or go over the mountain. Uh, there's also going to be peripheral proteins, which will be proteins that for the most part stick to the heads of the phospholipids, but they don't embed themselves a whole bunch into the actual membrane itself. And so you'll see uh, they'll typically look like they're kind of just glued onto the outer part of the membrane. And so when you're looking at stuff that's peripheral proteins, you'll see that they tend to be, have purposes that are going to be more like uh, signaling and things like that, where they don't have to go through the membrane. They just need to be in the location where something bumping into the membrane would come in contact with them. Kind of like you can put a label in, on a package. You don't have to put it in a package. As long as they can scan the label, it doesn't matter where it's at. It doesn't have to be embedded. And then lastly, which we'll talk about coming up too, carbohydrates. These are typically going to be those oligosaccharides we've brought up before, which are going to be short chains of monosaccharides that are strung together. Uh, and they'll typically be attached to either the phospholipids themselves, uh, we'll call those glycolipids if they're attached to them, or they can be attached to proteins, which we'll call glycoproteins then. And so they'll serve a spe uh, special function. Specifically, they'll serve a function that's largely like an ID tag. Uh, where we can read these carbohydrates and based upon which carbohydrates are on the cell, it gives us a sense of is the cell our cell? You know, it can send kind of a message and let us know what's going on. So this is useful for things like our immune system uh, because it'll, uh, this is useful some receptors because they can then kind of get a feel for, okay, is this our cell? Is this a foreign cell? And they can react accordingly. It's kind of like your ID card at school. If you don't have the right ID card, then you get thrown out. Uh, in our case, in our body, if you don't have the right ID card, you'd probably get eaten by a white blood cell. Okay, protein function. So these are the jobs that we're going to see. So proteins will function in transport, which we'll talk about during cell transport a little bit later. Uh, and so especially those transmembrane proteins uh, will sometimes have channels, or sometimes we'll call them carrier proteins or pumps where they can change shape. And so they can bring things into or out of the cell that otherwise couldn't get in. So you'll see a lot of times these transport proteins will be used for things like ions because ions do not get along with the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, they can also be, also be used for some slightly larger things that we have that are polar that would not come in elsewise. But they're going to kind of take the place of things that otherwise could not pass through the phospholipid bilayer. Next, we've got enzyme activity. So you will have during cell respiration, during photosynthesis, some of the enzymes that we use will be embedded in the membrane. 
Uh, there's a variety of reasons for this that we'll get into more later. Uh, some of it involves gradients. Sometimes it's just a location because you need a bunch of enzymes to be really close to each other because you have a multi-step process. But you will see that plenty of enzymes will be embedded in the membrane or embedded onto the membrane. Uh, depending on the enzyme specifically, it may or may not need to actually pass through the membrane itself. Communication. So we already talked about that you have some of these glycoproteins that can be used to kind of send a signal, if you will, that can be used to uh, advertise kind of who you are. You can also have receptors that are proteins that can read those things, that can uh, receive various chemicals either from cells they touch or from things far away like hormones that might come from your brain, but yet your big toe can still have receptors and pick up those hormones from the blood and, and I'll say decide even though it's a chemical process, but kind of decide what to do with it. And then lastly, we've got a whole bunch of stuff for connections, where some of these proteins can be used as part of what we call the extracellular matrix, where you can connect various proteins to each other to kind of hold your cells together. Uh, so this would be kind of like loosely holding them together. So you still got plenty of flex and such. We've got proteins like collagen that do this. That's the stuff that keeps your skin taut. As you get older, you tend to have kind of a loss of some of that collagen, so you tend to wrinkle, you tend to have your face sag, and that's why if you look up facial creams or, or body creams that are meant to get rid of wrinkles, they'll oftentimes say they have collagen in them. I don't know that rubbing collagen on you will actually somehow make it absorb into your body and get used, but they do sell it, and it is legitimate in the sense that collagen is used to make your skin tighter. It's just, I don't know if you, you know, for in terms of eating and such, you wouldn't normally just rub a steak on yourself and say, oh yeah, this will work. You would normally have to ingest it. I'm not suggesting you ingest your facial cream. I'm just saying that I don't know that ultimately uh, collagen, regardless of what you do, is going to just suddenly pop up in your skin. I'd have to see studies on that, but you can always be a little bit skeptical of some of those things. Uh, they sometimes stretch what's a fact and kind of adjust it to fit their needs as far as how you can manipulate that fact, if you will. Uh, they'll also have connections where some of these guys will connect to other proteins that are immediately right there on other cells that are part of the other cell's cell membrane. So by doing this, you can connect cells very tightly. So this is useful in areas where you want it to be watertight. So like in certain parts of plants and such, they want to get these guys all kind of welded together, literally or riveted together. And so they can use these proteins to connect them between the cell membranes. You can do this in animal cells too. And it makes them very tightly held together so it's harder for, for fluid and such to pass through. So it allows for us to do some interesting structuring within our body by using these connections to either hold cells together loosely or very tightly, you know, uh, for a variety of purposes based upon what tissue we're talking about. Obviously, some tissues want much more flex. Some tissues are around fluids where they want to make sure it's not going to leak around. Uh, if you've got like the urethra, blood vessels, they'd probably want to be sealed a lot more in terms of how those guys connect so you're not leaking too much fluid out uh, versus you've got other stuff like skin in that that you want to be fairly flexible so it doesn't tear if there's pressure applied to it. It has some give. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can use these proteins for. So don't assume that they're kind of one-dimensional. This is why the mosaic part is such a big deal, because while membranes overall are very similar with some cholesterol, phospholipid bilayer, uh, and then some proteins and carbs mixed in, the idea of which proteins especially, and to a lesser extent which carbs, really details whether or not that, that cell can function in the task it's given. I mean, it can be something where it's going to be metabolic in terms of that, that membrane, uh, like the inner membrane of the mitochondria, or it could be one that's much more tr uh, transport, which would be something like the nerve cell or a neuron. It would be like their membranes because they do a lot of accepting signals and releasing signals. So based upon what you want to do with the cell, you can modify it a lot. And you can't just take the membrane from a nerve cell and expect it to work uh, as a, a I'll try to do it like muscle cell. You can't expect it to work the same as you would a skin cell. Uh, you can't expect it to work the same as you would uh, epithelial tissue in general. So you can't, you got to make sure that it fits the purpose. So don't assume, despite the fact that I say that membranes are pretty much all alike, don't assume that means that they're all equal because they're not. Now, going forward tomorrow, we're going to pick up and I'll go through the two basic ideas of transport, which I'll, I'll briefly introduce. We're going to talk about passive transport, and we're going to talk about active transport. And what I want to do very quickly here is just make sure you guys keep in mind the, the general idea of what's going on.
whenever something's passive, that's going to mean something that doesn't need any ATP, no energy. Whenever something's active, that means it's going to need ATP, it's going to need energy. And whenever we talk about passive transport, it's going to revolve around this idea of going from something that ultimately has a high concentration of something to going to an area that has a low concentration. So this is what you'd kind of expect that if a bunch of people are in a room crowded and you open up another room that some of them would leave to kind of spread out. Or if you have one line that's at whatever store you're shopping at and it's really backed up and they open a new lane, you'll see people kind of move to the area of low concentration. That's passive. Active is just going to be the opposite. So I always got to fight with people to make sure they just realize this. So it is ultimately going to, oops, I said no ATP. It's ultimately going to use ATP, all right? So it's going to need ATP, and it's going to go from an area of low concentration to an area of high. So it's going to do the opposite. This is like when you're trying to put air into a balloon. You know, the balloon doesn't want to fill. You have to expend energy, sometimes a lot, painfully, to make sure that you can force the air in there to make it more concentrated, to pressurize it. It's kind of like making water kind of go up. You know, it's fairly easy to make it come down, but going up, you have to pump it. You know, you've got to put in energy to make it go against the gradient, against what it wants to do. So we'll pick up with that tomorrow. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. Hope you have a good night. Take it easy.